Welcome to Navarra Live. I'm Michael Walker and I'm joined by Dahlia Gabriel. And I think it's been a while since I've had you on, Dahlia, or has or just a lot happened since you've last been on? Wh- which one is it? Yeah, I mean, uh, I have I had some sort of pre-booked time off to try and finish my my PhD, which is due very soon. I have to say it's been very difficult to focus um, because it's been a really, I think, a very tough couple of weeks for anyone with you know a heart and a brain. And I'm going to apologise in advance for rambling a little bit today because obviously I've been sitting on a lot of thoughts and feelings and. This is the first time I'll be able to actually share them with our audience. But but yeah. Let them all out. Let them all out. Um, coming up later tonight, we speak to the director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign about the BDS bill, which is back in the Commons. Um, very poor timing, I think. Um, pressure on Keir Starmer is also growing over his position over Israeli war crimes. And rapper Loki takes on Piers Morgan in a debate on Israel-Palestine. Stay tuned for all of that. From journal editors to tube train drivers, all sorts of people are facing cancellation for supporting Palestine. But now Israel has gone one step further. They want to cancel the United Nations. The row started when the UN General Secretary said this. I have condemned unequivocally the horrifying and unprecedented 7 October acts of terror by Hamas in Israel. Nothing can justify the deliberate killing, injuring, and kidnapping of civilians or the launching of rockets against civilian targets. All hostages must be treated humanely and released immediately and without conditions. And I respectfully note the presence among us of members of their families. Excellencies, it is important to also recognize the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. They have seen their land steadily devoured by settlements and plagued by violence, their economy stifled, their people displaced, and their homes demolished. Their hopes for a political solution to their plight have been vanishing. But the grievances of the Palestinian people cannot justify the appalling attacks by Hamas, And those appalling attacks cannot justify the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. Now, that was an impressively balanced description of events from Antonio Guterres. And if you could hear a hint of outrage in his voice, it's not surprising. Israeli airstrikes have already killed 35 UN staff in Gaza. So let's see how Israel's UN ambassador responded. The UN is failing. And you, Mr. Secretary General, have lost all morality and impartiality. Because when you say those terrible words that these heinous attacks did not happen in a vacuum, you are tolerating terrorism. And by tolerating terrorism, you are justifying terrorism. Hamas, as the minister explained, beheaded babies, burned families, raped women, abducted Kids, babies, Holocaust survivors. And the SG is blaming the victim? You are blaming Israel? This is a pure blood libel. This is a pure blood libel. And I think that the Secretary General must resign. Now you hear this phrase, blood libel. Um, thrown around a lot. Now, what it refers to is the anti-Semitic canard, which was popular in the medieval period. Um, It falsely accused Jews of murdering Christian boys in order to use their blood in the performance of religious rituals. Um, Now, that horrible lie was spread, um, and sometimes it would incite pogroms. So that's what he's referring to there. Now, you probably don't need to be told that Antonio Guterres didn't do that. He wasn't sharing a blood libel, right? He pointed out the obvious, which is that people living under brutal occupation often take desperate measures. You know, as the Palestinian ambassador pointed out and was misquoted by Kay Burley on Sky, he's saying people have been predicting that something like this would happen if the Palestinians didn't have their conditions improved. If you give people no political outlet, if you make their life ever more miserable, then extreme actions might take place. That's not to justify anything, it's to explain it. Guterres also pointed out that Israeli airstrikes are killing lots of civilians, including 
children. Now, that's not a trope about Jews. That's not a blood libel. It's a fact about Israel. But Israel has gone further than just giving angry press conferences. After delivering those remarks, the ambassador went on army radio and said this. Due to his remarks, we will refuse to issue visas to UN representatives. We have already refused a visa for Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Martin Griffiths. The time has come to teach them a lesson. Now, I wonder why um, the Israelis would want the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs not to come into the region of Israel Palestine. Maybe he doesn't want them. Maybe Netanyahu doesn't want them anywhere near Gaza, right? Because if you've got someone who is in a role where they care about humanitarian issues, then you don't want them to see what's going on there. It all to me seems a lot like a rogue state throwing its toys at the pram. But Rishi Sunak is siding with the Israelis. A spokesperson for Rishi Sunak has told the BBC they disagree, that the UK government disagree with Guterres' vacuum comments, presumably meaning they think the October attacks did, in fact, occur in a vacuum. This is the level of political analysis that these people are working at. Despite, however, pushback from Israel and their allies, Guterres is standing strong. I am shocked by the misrepresentations by some of my statement yesterday in the Security Council, as if, as if I was justifying acts of terror by Hamas. This is false. It was the opposite. In the beginning of my intervention yesterday, I clearly stated, and I quote, I have condemned unequivocally the horrifying and unprecedented 7 October acts of terror by Hamas in Israel. Nothing can justify the deliberate killing, injuring, and kidnapping of civilians or the launching of rockets against civilian targets. End quote. Indeed, I spoke of the grievances of the Palestinian people. And in doing so, I also clearly stated, and I quote, but the grievances of the Palestinian people cannot justify the appalling attacks by Hamas, end quote. And then I went on with my intervention, referring all my positions on all aspects of the Middle East crisis. I believe it was necessary to set the record straight, especially out of respect to the victims and to their families. That was a really strong statement there, I think. A proper pushback. Now, I mean, when he when he came on screen in the studio, we were a little bit worried that was it was he gonna roll back from what he said? You know, it was quite brave to say that. Absolutely correct, but somewhat brave to say it. But no, he stood up and said, you have misrepresented me. And I do think this is relevant because, I mean, if you've been looking at Twitter recently, you will see there are people in all different walks of life who are terrified to talk about Palestine because they're worried they're going to lose their jobs. There are agents, um, you know, people who work in the, the film industry, um, people who work in the publishing industry, train drivers, as we've talked about on previous shows, lots of people who are terrified that if they say what they think about Israel-Palestine, their job is going to be at risk. And I think what this shows is that, you know, no one is safe from these accusations. So this is the UN General Secretary, Secretary General, right? So, I mean, he's he's not the most powerful person in the world because international law isn't more important than the, the brute power of nation states. But you could say on, on, on one level, he is the person with the most legitimacy um, in the world to speak on anything political, right? This is the UN is the only international organization we have that has really any legitimacy and he's the head of it. So, you know, you'd think he should have a fair amount of leeway to say what he thinks and not be misrepresented. But Israel even tried to misrepresent that guy, right? They tried to get him to lose his job. So if they'll go after the Secretary General of the UN, who won't they go after, right? And again, this is for saying something that he said live on television. They tried to misrepresent someone for saying something live on television. They go, like, oh, he said that we saw what he said. He wasn't justifying terrorism. What he was doing is saying that this horrific violence happens in a context, and it's a context that all right-thinking people have been talking about for decades, which is the oppression of the Palestinians, the fact that you have blocked off any kind of political um, conventional route for liberation, that you are putting these people under apartheid. And then, yes, you, you're surprised when something awful happens. You know, that, that's the kind of situation you have created where something awful might happen. I'm really glad the UN um, Secretary General has pushed back. I think it's very, very cowardly and that the UK government have said, oh, we don't concur with what he said because every, again, every right-thinking person, I think, would listen to that and say that was perfectly reasonable, what he said.
Um, Dahlia, I'm very impressed um, with the Secretary General of, of the UN. What's your, what's your take on this? What we've seen um, over the past several weeks, but also not just the past several weeks, what we've seen over the past, you know, 40, 50 years is this immensely powerful kind of message discipline. Uh, And this message discipline basically states that Arabs and Palestinians are simply a barbaric people and they are simply motivated by a craven and barbaric and backwards desire for, for violence and hatred of anything that any reasonable person um, may love um, or may care about. And anything that, and when I say message discipline, I don't mean that there's like a big WhatsApp group that lots of the people are deciding what the line is about. What I mean by that is the nation states that have the power uh, and share po- specific geopolitical interests in the region, in the, in the Arab world, um, have this kind, this is how they narrate events that happen in the region. This is how they narrate the world that we live in. And that gets picked up by newspapers, by media, by culture in you know the Western world, because people are predisposed to believe this about Arabs, to believe that Arabs are simply mindlessly violent people. Um, and what has happened here, and you know, this happens all the time, this kind of message discipline between nation states and, um, and the media. And it always forms the precursor to the kind of violence that we, we see. You know, we saw it in during the Vietnam War when, you know, musicians and artists and politicians were blacklisted from working for several years because they had the audacity to just be mildly critical or mildly questioning of the terms on which the Vietnam War was being conducted. The same with the Iraq War. You know, you look at people like the Dixie Chicks, you know, a country pop group who went from being immensely popular to being unable to work in the US anymore because they opposed the Iraq war. The same thing we are seeing now, this kind of coordination of message discipline. And what simply happened there was that the UN Secretary General veered away from that message discipline by doing what any reasonable person would do, which is to ask the question, why did this escalation happen? Um, But I would say that, you know, obviously Israel has, has backlashed against that significantly. That's what I would expect. But I think what is different about this moment to other moments, because it's worth mentioning that this is not, of course, the first time that Israel has sieged, has put a siege on Gaza. And every time this happens, the UN does generally condemn, um, you know, the occupation and does generally condemn uh, block the blockade on Gaza. I think what's actually different now is that it's not just the UN that are cutting through this message discipline that we have seen emerge over the past several weeks. What's cutting through is the voice of Palestinian journalists, and that has been really difficult this time. This that has been really different this time, which obviously is partly because of social media. We have had, in a way that I can't remember we have ever had before, Palestinian journalists being able to, in the most dire conditions, create ample amounts of content and really shed light on the reality of what is going on in their land. And not only in a way that is about shed, shedding light on suffering, which of course, you know, has been, is, has been incredibly important for us to, to be able to see as a global community, but also portraying the Palestinians as what they are, which is a people who are deeply committed to humanity and life in the most dire conditions. And it has been very difficult for people to square what they have been told about what the Palestinians are, which is this violently barbaric people that have to be contained and imprisoned because if they're allowed to live freely, um, they will simply commit mindless acts of violence. It's very difficult to square that with what we have seen coming out from Gaza during this time, which is, you know, I'm thinking about the things I've seen. It's things like 
Palestinian journalists singing to children who have been orphaned by Israeli airstrikes, or Palestinian surgeons performing surgeries on people using mobile flashlights. Or, you know, one thing that really, really cut me was you know, Queering the Map, which is a map where people from around the world, you know, queer people from around the world write about how they're feeling in any given moment from different parts of the world. And you see from Gaza, a young queer, what I imagine was a young queer Palestinian talking about how, you know, a crush that he had on one of his neighbors and saying, you know, I'm sorry I didn't have the courage to kiss you when I wanted when 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 we when you were alive you're dead now I will likely be dead and I'm I will kiss you in heaven I mean reading things like that it's impossible to not read that and think and see the Palestinians as as a people who are committed to life and humanity and freedom in the most dire circumstances. And that is very difficult to square with what we are being told about who the Palestinians are. And ultimately, when all is said and done, it is actually not going to be up to the Palestinians to prove to us their humanity, but actually we are going to be the ones who are going to have to prove our humanity to the Palestinians after we have allowed what what has happened to them to happen, not just over the past couple of weeks, but over the past 75 years. And so that kind of, yes, what the UN has done is significant, but I think what has really changed the landscape has been the ability of Palestinians to speak for themselves and represent themselves in this moment, which they have done with immense courage and and humanity. Um, And I think that for me has been what has really marked the past couple of weeks, more so than any, more so than anything else, and has made this instance of Israeli bombardment on Gaza different to, to, to historic ones and why I think the mood has changed so dramatically and why everyday people are so out of step with how their governments have portrayed um, have portrayed the Palestinians over the past few weeks. I mean, that was really powerfully put. I, I totally agree with what you're saying there, and especially, I mean, we have been on this show sort of looking at all the, the brilliant moments where Palestinian journalists have both basically sort of broken through the crap of our mainstream media and put forward their reality. And it is so powerful. And I do agree with you that it does feel um, different this time in terms of public opinion. It does feel like it's going to be harder um, for Israel to get away with it. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's so interesting how they do seem to be to some degree on the back foot. Now, we shouldn't overstate this, right? We should not overstate this. Israel still has overwhelming military power. They are still bombing Gaza to smithereens night after night after night after night this is not a situation where they're where they're scared right they are committing war crimes day after day after day after day but i do think there is a real danger here they lose the information war and i think that's important and i think that matters um and i and i do think them sort of going after the un secretary general does look like them throwing their toys out the pram i don't think many people see this sort of angry press conference where someone's saying the un general secretary or secretary general should, should resign and thinks oh yeah that seems like a a nice reasonable state who we should trust and side with um i want to continue on this topic of israel and the united nations because israel has a complicated relationship with the u and the UN had a key role in Israel's creation, as it was a 1947 Security Council resolution that gave international legitimacy to the partition of historic Palestine. But there are also UN resolutions which have proved uncomfortable for Israel. In particular, Resolution 194 passed in 1948, and that still provides the basis for the Palestinian right to return. So the people who were expelled from their homes in 1948, them and their descendants still have a right to return to that land. Um, Security Council Resolution 242 is uh, another one um, which makes Israel uncomfortable because that makes it illegal for Israel to expand settlements beyond its pre-1967 borders. So those are two um, resolutions which I suppose are in favour of the Palestinians, but the resolution that created Israel um, is is one they are presumably rather grateful for. Yet, um, because Israel prefers the doctrine of might makes right to following international law, more often than not, Israel has found itself at loggerheads with the UN. Now, this has only escalated under the leadership of Netanyahu in 2019, after the UN Human Rights Council proposed a probe into Israel's bombing of Gaza. Netanyahu accused the organisation of an obsessive hatred of Israel. 
Netanyahu's opposition to a UN probe was unsurprising. In 2009, UN investigators looked into Israel's bombing of Gaza that year and concluded this. We came to the conclusion, on the basis of the facts we found, that there was strong evidence to establish that numerous serious violations of international law, both humanitarian law and human rights law, were committed by Israel during the military operations in Gaza. The mission concluded that actions amounting to war crimes and possibly, in some respects, crimes against humanity were committed by the Israel Defense Force. So they didn't like that. They try and make um, sure the UN can't write any more reports into their actions in Gaza. Now, of course, that conclusion was diplomatically damaging for Israel. Also damaging is the amount of times Israel has ended up bombing UN schools and hospitals. Of course, Israel would prefer the UN to clear out of Gaza so they can dismiss all their targets as Hamas. If a school falls down, if a hospital falls down, oh, it was Hamas. That's harder when you've got UN workers there. Yet, while Israel often receives criticism from UN bodies, it also has a trump card up its sleeve. And that's all because of its powerful sponsor. The United States, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, has a veto on any binding resolution the UN can pass. And boy, has it used that veto. Just last week, it was the US that vetoed UN calls for a humanitarian pause in the Israel-Hamas war. It is at least the 54th time the United States has blocked a UN Security Council resolution critical of Israel. According to Al Jazeera, the US's unequivocal support of Israel has seen it thwart resolutions condemning violence against protesters, illegal Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank built since 1967, and even calls for an investigation into the 1990 killing of seven Palestinian workers by a former Israeli soldier. It's incredible what you can get away with when you have friends in high places. That support for the United States um, of Israel on the UN Security Council is pretty much unconditional, and it is one of the many reasons why countries in the global south do not take the West seriously when they talk about Russia breaking international law in Ukraine, because they know that so long as you are a US ally, an ally of the West, you will get all, um, you know, total support in any international institution. So the idea of international law, you can see why lots of people don't have much faith in it. The siege and bombardment of Gaza continues into its 19th day. And in signs of a worsening humanitarian crisis in the territory, Oxfam has issued this stark warning. The NGO has accused Israel of using starvation as a weapon of war against civilians. The use of starvation as a weapon is a war crime prosecutable in the International Criminal Court. And if it were to be heard there, there would be plenty of evidence because not only has Israel blocked food from entering Gaza, they've also bombed several major bakeries in airstrikes. Now, these children were injured in an airstrike on a large bakery in the Magazi refugee camp. They're being treated in hospital for their injuries, but the health ministry has now said that Gaza's healthcare system is in, quote, a state of complete collapse. The Magazi refugee camp is in the city of Deir al-Bala, and this is what's left of one of its neighborhoods after the bombing last night. Now, Deir al-Bala is well south of the Wadi Gaza bridge, so it's supposed to be an area safe for Gazan civilians who were told by Israel to evacuate the north of the territory. So far, Gaza's health ministry says that more than 6,700 Palestinians have been killed in this strip. More than 2,700 of them are children. The number of people injured is now more than 17,000. And according to UNICEF, there have been over 5,000 child casualties in less than three weeks. The organization has called those figures, quote, a growing stain on our collective consciousness. They've also called for an immediate ceasefire. Aid is slowly being allowed to enter Gaza by the Rafah crossing from Egypt. 20 trucks crossed the border last night, but it's a fraction of what's needed, especially as that aid doesn't include fuel. Now, Israel doesn't want to allow that to enter. They say it could be used by Hamas, but director of the UN Relief and Works Agency, Tom White, told CNN this. We really need to find a solution to the fuel situation. Otherwise, our aid operation will come to a stop. People will not have access to clean drinking water and hospitals will be closing. Even if convoys come into Gaza, we won't have the fuel in our trucks to collect and distribute that aid. Responding to the UN's plea for fuel, the IDF, so the Israel Defense Forces, responded with this. These fuel tanks are inside Gaza. They contain more than half a million liters of fuel. Ask Hamas if you can have some. And when they've sort of released this aerial photo of what they say are uh, oil tankers. Um, two responses there. Apparently, this is enough oil that would that would last six hours um, to run Gaza. The other response, if the IDF know there's half a million litres of Hamas-owned fuel in those tanks, 
why hasn't it bombed them, right? They're, they're willing to bomb schools and hospitals. If you think this oil is going to be used for terrorism, why don't you bomb them? Maybe they're empty, right? I, I don't think it's plausible to say we're not letting fuel in because it will be used to terrorism, but also there's all this fuel here which we're just ignoring. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. In the UK, the deadly assault on Gaza was debated in Prime Minister's questions. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak called for, quote, a pause in the conflict to allow aid to enter the territory, but rejected all calls for a ceasefire. And also in Parliament this afternoon, MPs will debate the Economic Activity of Public Bodies Bill. Now, this might sound technical, but it's extremely relevant to the Gaza war, as it would ban local authorities and other public bodies from boycotting Israel. It's been brought before Parliament by Community Secretary Michael Gove, with one Tory MP describing it as, quote, madness to push ahead with it in the current crisis. The bill would affect public bodies boycotting any state for humanitarian grounds, but it does give Israel a special status, a special opt-out. In other words, it will be harder to boycott Israel than anyone else. Amnesty International has described the proposed law as, quote, dangerous and draconian. And its UK chief executive have, has said this about the bill. It is alarming that the bill singles out a country, Israel, and gives it unique exemption from international law. Instead of bringing forward divisive and unnecessary legislation, ministers should urgently focus on pressing all parties to the conflict in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories to adhere to international humanitarian law, for the International Criminal Court to investigate possible war crimes by all parties, and for the root causes of the current crisis to be addressed to prevent future violations. I'm joined now by Director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, Ben Jamal. Thank you so much for, for joining us. What do you make of MPs debating this bill right now? For some of the reasons you've outlined in your quote from Am Amnesty is a really pernicious bill that, as you say, is particularly um, designed to target uh, campaigns calling for boycott, divestment and sanctions against Israel, but is very, very broad in its scope. Um, so, which is why, it, um, the, you know, a very large coalition of opposition of more than 70 civil society organisations has lined up to oppose it. It's very broad. It includes the Methodists, the Quakers, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, many, many others. Um, so the bill was tabled in July, so it's already been um, progressing through, but the government made a decision uh, to bring the next stage of the bill forward uh, to debate it now. That's pretty grotesque. It's very, very clear uh, political opportunism. The government thinks it can take advantage of the current moment. It can take advantage of the sort of calls across the political mainstream for um, universal solidarity with Israel, and it wants to play games with the Labour Party. It wants uh, to shift the Labour Party from not a great position, but one of opposition to the bill, if not fully on the right grounds, to say, Actually, if you want to show solidarity with Israel and you want to prove yourself and not to be anti-Semitic, that's the frame, unfortunately, of the discourse around the bill, then you will shift your position. So that's the reason why they brought it back today, which is um, grotesque. I agree. I won't repeat the quote of the Tory MP, but he's right in the, in the language that he used to describe this as, uh, as a monstrous thing to do at the moment, to try to exploit this appalling moment um, and to add to sort of community tensions, I think, uh, ar around what's happening at the moment. So it's it's an appalling decision, but an entirely predictable one. Could you talk a bit more about how Israel is sort of singled out and given special status in this law? Because, you know, as far as I understand, they're saying you're a public body. You, you shouldn't boycott um, states because that could affect our foreign policy. I suppose that's their justification. It doesn't seem particularly strong in any case. But w what's this sort of special status they've given to Israel? How does that work? It affects public bodies and it says they cannot make decisions, investment decisions. So whether that's a, uh, you know, an investment in a pension fund uh, or a procurement decision, they can't make investment decisions that are based on moral or political disapproval of the conduct of a state. So that's very, very broad, which is why there is this broad coalition of opposition, because it means, for example, um, if, uh, let's say, a local government pension scheme wanted to decide we're not going to invest in this particular company because it is supporting X state in a deforestation and therefore causing climate destruction, that would be disallowed. If you wanted to divest from company B uh, because it's complicit in supporting China's abuse of the rights of the Uyghur people, um, that also would be disallowed by the bill. But there is a specific prov provision in the bill 
that gives uh, extra protection to Israel. So there's a clause in the bill that says uh, a government minister, by a statement, can say uh, certain states are excluded from consideration. And the government's already said, if this bill passes, we will immediately issue a statement to say this doesn't apply uh, to Russia. You can take action to divest from Russia because of its uh, illegal occupation um, of the Ukraine. But one state, Israel, is given special protection. So there's a clause in the bill that says no future government can ever ex um, make this bill not apply to Israel. So nobody can ever, by a statement in the House, say uh, public bodies are allowed to divest from Israel. So it's given that special and unique protection. It's phenomenal, isn't it? I mean, especially as people, you know, understandably complain about people sort of singling out Israel or holding it to a higher standard, the suspicion being that this is sort of motivated by anti-Semitism. Now, I, I tend to find those sort of accusations a bit spurious anyway. But then to put in a bill that there's one country and only one country that gets this special status and it's Israel just seems bizarre, um, incredibly unjustifiable. Um, I want to talk about a slightly different theme. So the marches, um, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign has been a part of the organisation of. I went to the one on, on Saturday. It was huge. Um, I wondered if you could just give us sort of some some context about how they're sort of organised. I mean, when I was on it, I was sort of you know impressed by the number of people, by the diversity of people thinking, how did all these people get here? How did they all find out about this? So what's your, what light can you sort of bring to those questions? Since very shortly after October the 7th, we have been organising, first of all, a very small immediate demonstration um, in the immediate aftermath, once the assault on Gaza had begun. Uh, and then two consecutive marches. The first one, where our estimate was there were 150,000 people marching, and then the one you described last week, where, um, and potentially a conservative estimate, um, 300,000. I was in a meeting with the police today because we're planning our next one, and they said to me, because uh, they were trying to get an estimate of the numbers coming, that the march uh, was three and a half hours long in the sense of uh, from the beat, from the, where we had arrived. Uh, at Downing Street to the tail end, there were people solid three and a half hour, hours back coming out still of Marble Arch. So an exceptionally large march. Uh, we mobilise across. So, you know, um, we, we work with a um, a, a body of uh, co-organisers. Um, all of us have quite good mobilising power. We PSC's got 80 branches across the UK. Many of those were working actively to book coaches. I was informed, for example, there were eight coaches coming down from Preston alone. Um, and as I think you've said and other people reported, it was a very diverse crowd. It was quite a young crowd. Um, and it was an incredibly peaceful march. The other thing it's worth noting, it, it, it comes in a context, this is familiar, but it's on steroids at the moment, the attempt to demonize those who are marching. So before we even began, uh, before we called the first big march, we had the Home Secretary suggesting that the police should look with suspicion at anybody raising the flag of Palestine, that you know it wasn't inherently uh, support for terrorism, but it may well be, so look with suspicion. So you know there were people concerned are we going to be arrested if we're carrying the flag of Palestine? We had the attempt to demonize, uh, again, familiar to demonize the popular chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, a legitimate slogan of liberation, an attempt to say, no, that's a genocidal call for the elimination of all Jewish people. You had the police imposing really unusual restrictions on the, on the march of Section 12, which um, allowed a condition that said anybody deviating from the march um, could be arrested, which led people to ask us, well, does that mean if I pop into Sainsbury's or if I need to take my kids to the toilet, am I violating that? So in those sort of circumstances, with a climate of fear and then the usual protest, a usual process, uh, which is a whole range of people going to the march solely with the intention to try to find in a crowd of 300,000 people, five to 10 problematic placards, plaster them all over the national newspapers on the Monday saying this was a, a manifestation of hate speech on the streets of, of the UK. In those circumstances, and on a very wet day, uh, for 300,000 people to come, speaks to, I'm not going to claim it's the result of brilliant mobilising efforts, it's a big logistical exercise, 
it manifests the degree. You know, Dali was talking about this earlier. What is happening in terms of public opinion? And some of that is motivated by people seeing the reality, understanding the root causes of this, but seeing the absolute disconnect between the fundamental issues of justice here and how this is being responded to across our political uh, classes. And that's what's motivating people to come out in these historically huge numbers. I think lots of people watching this will be thinking, you know, what impact can we have? What's the plan? What's the strategy? Now, you know, I'm not expecting the Palestine Solidarity Campaign to be able to, you know, directly transform British foreign policy, let alone Israeli foreign policy. But to the extent that sort of the British public can have an impact on what's going on, um, what's what's Palestine Solidarity Campaign sort of ideas for for how this this movement can move forward? Well, this is a number of things. And I think I mean, marches and protests like this are always, are always trying to deliver a number of messages. There is a very urgent one that's the priority at the moment, which is the call for the ceasefire. Um, for the, the, the very straightforward reason that you've sort of delivered, what we're witnessing at the moment, there are more and more people using the language um, of this as a textbook case of genocide. You know, you quote with the figures of people that died, the number of children who have died. This is only going to increase, if, particularly if we go to a ground invasion. So there's a basic humanitarian call that should be, you think, responded to by anybody with a shred of decency, which is the killing has got to stop. But again, as you've said, and as you know, you quote with Oxfam, we're on the brink of a humanitarian disaster. All basic infrastructure in Gaza is collapsing. Um, and there's no good calling for humanitarian aid to go in. If there isn't a ceasefire, it cannot be safely delivered. So that's that's a fundamental message which we're trying to achieve pressure uh, on politicians through the marches, but through other actions. We've got um, e-actions targeting MPs. There are other groups who are organising phone blockades of MPs, constituencies to deliver the message. We want you to shift the position on this. Um, then we want, you know, there will be, the moment, we don't want to lose sight of this, where we turn to the root causes. You know, again, the narrative has been all of this started, you know, there was an escalation of violence. Violence returned on October the 7th, as if before that uh, we, we had peace. But on one very simple metric, you know, 250 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank from January the 1st to October the 6th, the, the day before the assault was launched from Gaza. So actually, we've got to deal with the root causes, which are straightforwardly, Israel's um, imposition of a system of military occupation and apartheid. So we want people um, who are mobilized to march to then join that longer term campaign to put pressure. You know, the call from Palestine is very straightforward. What can you do? And it is focus your attention uh, in your country to end the complicity of your government, your public bodies and your companies and corporations through campaigns of boycott, divestment and sanctions alongside all of the awareness raising we have to do to mobilize people to join that so that's that's the you know what we want to achieve through these mobilizations but the other important thing we're doing at the moment is delivering and i never underestimate this a message of solidarity to palestinians who are seeing the response of world governments they're used to it but have been given a message you can't use any form of armed resistance you know even inside the boundaries of international law you, you're not entitled to that you can't go through the UN and the international courts because that's defined as an act of diplomatic terrorism. You can't use tactics of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. You've just got to accept your fate um, and live comfortably within your within your chains. And they see that. Um, and what we're delivering is a message that's not the response of ordinary people around the world. And I got messages last Saturday from people in Palestine, um, deeply moving, if you consider what they're facing at the moment, they said, we see you, we see you. We see what you're doing. And that's also a fundamental important message that we're giving at the moment, that there are people of conscience in this country who will not allow the Palestinian people uh, to stand alone. That's the fundamental principle of solidarity, the heart of internationalism, that we recognize an injustice to you is an injustice to everyone. It's an injustice to us, and we will not stand for it. Benjamin, thank you so much for speaking to us um, this evening. And yeah, solidarity from us to the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. I'm sure many of our audience will be will be out marching on, on Saturday for your third big national demonstration. This is the clip that is still haunting Keir Starmer. I'm very clear Israel must have that, does have that right to defend herself. Um, and Hamas bears responsibility. A siege is appropriate. 
cutting off power, cutting off water? Well, I think that Israel does have that right. It is an ongoing situation. Um, obviously, everything should be done within international law. Now, that clip is haunting Starmer because many Labour supporters have strong solidarity with Palestinians and are shocked and appalled Starmer would back starving them. And it's caused particular upset among Britain's Muslim communities. In a bid to undo the damage, last weekend Starmer visited the South Wales Islamic Centre. He was there to build bridges. And it also presented a great photo opportunity, a chance to show the Labour leader standing in solidarity with members of the Muslim community inside their place of worship. Except it's backfired, and spectacularly so. On Tuesday night, the Islamic Centre posted a Facebook post distancing themselves from Starmer, and they've now released an official statement which goes further. Now, this is the first part. We fully understand and share the anger many in the Muslim community are feeling, both here in Wales and across the UK. We apologise for the hurt and confusion that our hosting of this visit has caused. Our strength is in our unity, and we are aware that this visit has weakened and undermined that unity. As one of Wales' oldest mosques, we have a rich tradition of positive engagement with politicians and community leaders. Our intention was to raise the concerns of the Muslim community around the suffering of Palestinians. And so we hosted an event initially with local representatives on the issue and the knowledge of Keir Starmer's attendance was given at short notice. Now, that's a pretty remarkable statement, right? It seems the Islamic Centre got so much backlash for meeting the Labour leader that they're now distancing themselves from the visit, not just from the leader, from the visit itself, right? The knowledge of Keir Starmer's attendance was given at short notice, they say. In other words, if we'd thought about it longer, it wouldn't have happened. It gets worse, though. Here's how the mosque describes how they understood Starmer's visit. There was a robust and frank conversation which reflected the sentiments Muslim communities are feeling at this time. Members of the community directly challenged Keir on his statements made on the Israeli government's right to cut food, electricity and water to Gaza, warranting war crimes, as well as his failure to call for an immediate ceasefire. We recognise that while our intention was to raise the issue of suffering of Palestinians, regrettably, the outcome has put the South Wales Islamic Centre and the wider Muslim community into disrepute. So from the mosque's perspective, this was a confrontational event. And by presenting it as something else, Keir Starmer has brought the mosque into disrepute, right? And they say this explicitly. So they say, we express our dismay at Keir Starmer's social media post, which stated this, quote, I was grateful to hear from the Muslim community of the South Wales Islamic Centre. I repeated our calls for all hostages to be released. I'm not sure why you're asking people in South Wales that. More humanitarian aid to enter Gaza for the water and power to be switched back on and a renewed focus on the two-state solution. And then the mosque says, we wish to stress Keir Starmer's social media post and images gravely misrepresented our congregants and the nature of the visit. So both the photos and Starmer's statement were a grave misrepresentation of what happened on that visit. Now, it sounds a lot as if, understandably, these people feel used. And they aren't the only people of Muslim faith feeling deeply unhappy with Starmer. ITV's political correspondent Shahab Khan has reported this. Pressure piles on Keir Starmer. More than 150 Muslim Labour councillors have written directly to the Labour leader, demanding he calls for a ceasefire in Gaza as backlash over his policy from within his party grows. Now, Shahab Khan has now tweeted an update to that figure. It's now risen to 250 Muslim Labour councillors demanding Starmer call for a ceasefire. Just as seriously, around 25 Labour councillors have resigned and problems are brewing in Westminster too. Sky News reports that the Labour leader has been meeting with Muslim MPs over their anger at his stance on Gaza. And it's not just Muslim MPs who are finding Starmer's position increasingly untenable. This is Shahab Khan again. Blimey, he says, multiple Labour MPs telling me that a couple of shadow cabinet members are considering resigning over Keir Starmer's handling of the Gaza situation. He goes on, these are non-Muslim MPs who are expressing concerns that are being raised directly to them by constituents and local community groups. The backlash has caused Starmer to update his position to some degree, though he hasn't retracted his earlier statements. And speaking in the House of Commons this Monday, he said this. There must now be clear humanitarian corridors within Gaza for those escaping violence. Civilians must not be targeted. And where Palestinians are forced to flee, they must not be permanently displaced from their homes. International law is clear. It also means basic services, including water, electricity, and fuel needed for it, cannot be denied. That's still pretty mealy-mouthed. Water, food, and fuel are being denied. 
So why not call for an end to the siege, just talking in abstractions? Food shouldn't be denied. Well, it is being denied. Of course, there's still no call for a ceasefire. And the reasons why are pretty pathetic. This was Shadow Minister Darren Jones speaking this morning on Sky. We've heard from Save the Children as well. And they've made a direct appeal to the Prime Minister to demand a ceasefire now. So are they misstepping, misstepping as well? I've not said anyone's misstepped, Kay, and I'm not saying Save the so Children I, I'm not quite sure what you are saying. Should there be a ceasefire or not? Well, to answer your question about Save the Children, yeah. again, I entirely empathise with their position. I mean, I watched the news last night of children being affected by this, and, you know, it's clearly deeply deeply sad and you don't want any child to be in that situation and I understand therefore why they are calling for that. All I'm saying to you is that uh, on issues of ceasefire or other issues there are proper diplomatic routes that need to be followed for those types of discussions to happen. It's not for uh, MPs such as myself in TV interviews. No, it's not just you're representing Labour today so you know but, that... But let me, let me answer that question as well though, okay, because the Labour Party is a party preparing for government. We hope that we might be in government next year. So what I say today could have implications for what a Labour government might have to do. No, but that's why I'm being very uh, limited in what I'm saying to you today, because if we are to come into government next year, it will be for David Lammy, our Foreign Secretary, for our diplomatic service to have conversations in a proper and professional way. Uh, and politicians can say things very easily or share things on social media or in news studios that can have implications for that type of process. We want it to have implications for that kind of process. Right? We might be in government, so we can't have any position on whether Israel should keep bombing kids. Now, it's precisely because you might be in government that you should be saying that. Now, it doesn't make a blind difference if, if, if me on Navarra Live say it's time for a ceasefire in Gaza. Right? I'm very glad you guys are listening to that. But that's, that's not going to influence Rishi Sunak, and it's not going to influence Israel. But the opposition, if you are going to be in government, then when you speak... You know, they're ahead in the poll, so it's likely they're going to be in government. When they speak, it matters. It has consequences. But they seem to be saying, well, if we were to speak, it would have consequences, and therefore we must not speak. No, it's precisely because what you say can have consequences that you must speak, right? There are thousands of kids dying. 700 people killed in 24 hours. And you're saying, oh, well, we might be in government, so, you know, we shouldn't really come to a position on this. What does that mean? It's the most pathetic, cowardly answer I can possibly imagine when you've got Kids, hospitals, being bombed, starved, under siege. You're saying we might be in government, so we can't possibly say this in case it has some implications down the line. We want it to have implications now, right? We need this to have implications today, let alone implications in a year's time when you might win a general election. It's, it's completely incoherent, completely pathetic. No one's buying it. I mean, fair play to Kay Burley there. We've got lots of problems with her. Um, but she was saying it's precisely because you're in government that, that I want you to give an answer, that I'm interested in what you have to say. That's the only reason you're here. You're not here, Darren Jones, because you're some interesting commentator and we think you've got fabulously interesting insight into the Israel-Palestine conflict. No, you're there because you might be a government minister in a year's time and we need to know what you think about international conflicts. What is your position? Where do you stand? Oh, I can't say that. Kistama released this statement today. So some update. It's clear that the amount of aid and essential utilities getting into Gaza is completely insufficient to meet the humanitarian emergency on the ground. So he's finally admitted that. That's why we have repeatedly said that aid, fuel, water, electricity and medicines must be urgently ramped up both through what can come in through the Rafa crossing and through Israel turning back on the supplies it controls. Well, they haven't repeatedly said, they've repeatedly sort of said in the abstract um, food should be turned on, but they haven't been sort of saying that that's actually a problem right now. All abstract, right? Let's go on. It is incumbent on all parties to make sure that the aid and utilities don't just get in, but reach those who need them. That's why we've said deliveries need to be regular, fast and safe. We welcome Secretary Blinken's comments last night and we support humanitarian pauses. In the long term, there can only be a political solution to the crisis, which is why we need to restart the hard work of talks for a two-state solution of a viable Palestinian state alongside a safe and secure Israel. I suppose to respond to that briefly, right? Two things to note here. He isn't even causing, calling for a ceasefire. He's called for a humanitarian pause. Like, what is a humanitarian pause? An hour so people can finally have 60 minutes where they're not worried the nair strike is going to hit the building next to them or the building they're in, right? Why a humanitarian pause? Why not a ceasefire? And also, he's only put this letter out after Rishi Sunak said he supports a humanitarian pause, after Secretary Blinken said he supports a humanitarian pause. So Keir Starmer is, is not only unwilling to lead public opinion, I mean, public opinion wants a ceasefire. He is waiting until Anthony Blinken, the Biden administration, until EU 
diplomats, they're all now calling for a humanitarian pause. Rishi Sunak is calling for a humanitarian pause. So Keir Starmer is, is, is literally following everyone. He's the last goddamn person to call for a humanitarian pause. He's supposed to be, or he was, a human rights lawyer, right? He's only just got around to calling for it now. The other thing to say here is, that I say this all the time, this, this talk of, oh, we need to restart a process for a two-state solution as if the problem is just that they've stopped talking, right? The problem is that one side has all the power, Israel, and they're not going to make any compromises. So if you care about a two-state solution, lots of people I respect think it's completely you know, impossible anyway, and you should go for a one state. I personally sort of am somewhat agnostic about one state or two state. The thing I know for sure is that you're only going to get some kind of remotely just outcome if a shed load of pressure is put on Israel. Because at the moment... They don't need to have a just one state solution or a two state solution. They can just have the reality, which is apartheid. Let's go to some further news on Starmer's meeting with Muslim Labour MPs today. So Tribune's Taj Ali has just tweeted this. I'm told Keir Starmer told Muslim MPs at a meeting earlier today that he refuses to apologize for his remarks on LBC endorsing the collective punishment of Palestinians. One source said no movement on calling for a ceasefire felt tokenistic and has made matters worse. Apparently, Starmer told one Muslim Labour MP that the party are waiting for the US to call for a ceasefire before they endorse such a position. What the hell? So Labour's foreign policy is, is literally now, they won't even consider anything before it's already US government policy. This is like new Labour reloaded. You know, like when, when Tony Blair was sort of on his, you know, disgraceful, criminal path to the Iraq war, what he would pretend is he'd say, well, the reason we have to go you know, into the Iraq war is because we need to be, into the, be in the room so that we can influence the United States. It was obviously, of course, delusional, but what he was saying is the United States are going to go to this war anyway. We want them to go through the UN as much as possible. We want them to, to try and respect human rights as much as possible. So it's important for us to be in there as this sort of moral voice, this, you know, this, this, this good angel on George W. Bush's shoulder, right, influencing him. Now, as I say, it was nonsense. I think Labour could have had a lot more influence. New Labour could have had a lot more influence by saying we're not going to war. I think that actually would have made the US not going to Iraq much more likely. But at least their idea was we're trying to pull the United States in a particular direction. Keir Starmer is saying, oh, I'm just going to wait until the United States make a press release and then I'll make a press release saying saying exactly the same thing. What the hell is the point in that? My opinions on Keir Starmer, you know, it's difficult for them to get much lower when it comes to this particular issue. They keep getting lower. Yeah. And before I go on specifically to to Keir Starmer and talking about the implications that this might have for Keir Starmer, not that I really give a fuck, but, um, you know, it's not just a Muslim issue. And I think I think it's really important to not allow this to be framed as a a religious issue. Of course, you know, that the Palestinian cause holds particular significance, um, particularly for people from the region who are obviously majority Muslim. But the Palestinian cause holds centre court in the hearts of a lot of the world, and particularly a lot of the world that have themselves been subject to colonialism. Uh, You know, the, the Irish are some of the most ardent advocates of, of Palestinian rights because they they have a sense of shared experience. When you turn a population into a refugee population, when you t- dispossess a population and push them to all four corners of the earth out of their home, it's it's like it's almost like scattering seeds. And you know, in where those seeds have fallen has bloomed, you know, a sense of of solidarity and a sense of deep understanding of of what's going on. So so it is obviously going to touch the Muslim community in a particular way because of the proximity to within the Arab world amongst all Arab people to this issue. But but it very much stretches beyond that. And, you know, you can see that um, on any Palestine demo. It's some of the most multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious, you know, cross age, cross class, you know, demonstrations that you can that you can find but but back to the labor party i mean this is t- this is a, a classic labor tactic um it's a classic labor approach which is to essentially see ethnic minorities as props and they rely not on offering you know and i'm talking about that at the leadership of the labor party level there has been a long history in the kind of local politics level of of genuine attempts to organize uh, to do anti-racist organizing but when we're talking about the leadership 
Um, it is pretty much an approach of we don't have to offer ethnic minorities in this country anything because the pitch that we're making is just that we're the lesser of two evils. Unfortunately, it doesn't get much worse than agreeing with the right of one state to cut off the electricity, food and water to a population that is 50 percent under the age of 15. So I think that is why uh, that strategy is having a particular issue uh, right now for Keir Starmer. And he knows that because if he didn't know that, then he wouldn't have ambushed this mosque, he would have been honest and authentic about what his intentions were. But he knew that if he didn't spring up on this mosque last minute, they wouldn't agree to be used as props by him in order to whitewash his, the very recent history he has of failing to condemn war crimes. Uh, and I don't think that any amount of mealy mouths, way too little, too late calls for humanitarian aid to enter are going to, to wash out this legacy. And especially because that it is meaningless to call for humanitarian aid without calling for a ceasefire. It's like repeatedly setting someone's house on fire and calling on some random abstract force to give them a bottle of water to deal with it. So, and without the call for a ceasefire, which is extremely popular amongst the British public, um, without the call, but you know, they should call for it even if it wasn't popular, but without the call for a ceasefire, calls for humanitarian aid is just mealy mouth nonsense, because until you go to the root cause of why such humanitarian aid is needed, there's no point in simply letting fewer through trucks at the rougher border when the dust settles um, on this, much in the same way that we look at people, look back at dis in disgust at Labour MPs who cheerleaded the, um, the invasion of the Iraq war and how that it's become a liability for so many. I mean, not enough of a liability, but has become a liability on their legacy. Um, I do think that every single Labour MP that has failed to come out and call for a ceasefire when it was opportune to do so will hang their heads in fucking shame. And to leave it to MPs like Zara Sultana, like Apsana Begum, who themselves are already extremely vulnerable to Islamic racism, who have the most to Islamic racism, Islamophobic racism, um, who, who have the most to lose, or the most vulnerable in this condition. They are the only ones that are actually stepping up and asking for the right thing. And so honestly, I think it's, you know, I just, they're, they're going to hang their heads. I hope they ha can hang their heads in shame um, for the way that they have behaved. Because if we can't even trust you to do the right thing on the precipice of a genocide, then what is exactly is the point? But I would also say, again, it's important to pin this on Keir Starmer's labor, but also this is kind of the modus operandi of the Labour Party, unfortunately, which is this sense of, you know, a transaction between very minor, the promise of minor and incremental improvements for the lives of, of working class people in this country happening hand in hand with the unleashing of extreme violence around on working class people across the world. And unfortunately, it begins with, you know, the Clement Attlee government, who whilst he was trying to build the NHS for British people in this country, he was supporting violent coups against Mossadegh in Iran for trying to do the same thing, providing a welfare state for his people. Um, same again, when we look at, 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 Iraq, at Tony Blair, this idea of, you know, oh, you know, the, a couple of sure start centers being seen as a reasonable transaction for, you know, the killing of a million Iraqis. This is a kind of a problem, a problematic contradiction that exists within the history of the British Labour Party, even at what we as progressives or socialists in Britain might consider the zenith of the Labour Party, you know, the, the peak of the Labour Party. This contradiction, this ultimate division of the working class across national and racial lines um, has always been the case, unfortunately. Sunak and Starmer have both been pathetic on the Gaza war, but there is one party leader who has been showing leadership. It's Scottish First Minister Hamza Youssef. You spoke to the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak yesterday, reiterating the Scottish government's calls for a ceasefire to allow more aid into the country. The UK government not joining your calls at the moment, neither is the leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer. Can I just ask what you make of his position at the moment? I find it infuriating. We're seeing thousands of people die. Children die. How many more children have to die before a ceasefire 
is called for. I mean, we're calling for a ceasefire. We, I cannot understand Sir Keir Starmer's position. I cannot understand the Prime Minister's position. And I asked them, how many more children have to die before you join us and join many in, uh, across the world, including the United Nations, and call for that ceasefire? Call all parties, not just one party here, call on all parties to commit to a ceasefire for the sake of those innocent children who are suffering so badly. Now, as I'm sure you know by now, Hamza Yusuf has um, his, his mother-in-law um, is in Gaza. Um, we've sort of seen videos from her on sort of previous shows. Um, so that's one reason he's talking about this so powerfully. Um, it seems odd to me that Starmer thinks it's too controversial to say that. I mean, let alone Sunak. I mean, Sunak should be calling for that as well. Obviously, there are many people in the British establishment who seem to want to give Israel as much leeway as possible to achieve their war aims, which seem to be um, as much destruction as possible of the Palestinian people in Gaza. And I think this is important when it comes to the ceasefire, actually, because what you keep hearing from um, supporters of Israel is to say, no, to call for a ceasefire would be what Hamas want, because it would allow them to um, sort of reorganize and to sort of refuel so that when the actual war comes, they're going to be prepared. Now, that to me just seems completely implausible, right? Hamas knew this was coming, right? Israel didn't. Israel didn't know what was going to happen on the 7th of October, but Hamas did. And I think they would have prepared for this, right? So they got miles and miles of tunnels under Gaza. Um, they would have made sure that there is enough there for, you know, military refueling or whatever. Um, I think they've probably got their soldiers in the right place. Do you know what I mean? These guys... Were, were planning for this. So why would a, would a pause, which would presumably allow Israel to sort of you know, reorganize, et cetera, why would that be such a problem for, for Israel? Well, the problem, the, re the reason it's a problem is because they want to get all of their war aims done as quickly as possible because they hope that there won't be enough international pressure by that point to stop them doing a genocide. You heard what they were saying immediately after the October 7th attack. They wanted to go into Gaza, kill as many people as possible, push as many people out to Egypt as possible and essentially take over the land. Right now, they've had to step back from that because you know Egypt said um, we're we're not going to allow this to happen. We're not going to allow you to to put Gazans into the Sinai um, Peninsula, part of Egypt, where Israel wanted them to go. Um, and then you know international pressure because of protests on the street that sort of mounts, um, gets more powerful. So the longer Israel take with this, the harder it's going to be for them to completely override any sense of international law. Why anyone would say, okay, yeah, that does seem like a problem for Israel. Let's let them do this as quickly as possible. No, the only thing doing this as quickly as possible allows for is for more war crimes to be done, is for more people to be massacred. It's not, it's not, there's, there's not a military reason here. There's a political reason. They want this done quickly so that they can do it under as little pressure um, with as little people seeing what they're doing as possible. So the idea that, oh, we shouldn't have a ceasefire so they can wipe out Hamas is, is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. All you are doing is covering for people who want to do their dirty work quickly. And by dirty work, what I mean is killing thousands and thousands of Palestinians, which they're already doing. Piers Morgan has gone head to head with rapper Loki about the Gaza war. And predictably, um, Morgan spent a lot of time demanding Loki condemn the October 7th attacks. This is what happened. I completely agree with you about the plight of the Palestinian people. I've tweeted about this for the last two weeks. No, no, to be fair, you haven't, Piers, and this is not journalism. Shirin Abu well, Akhla was tweets. journalism. Yasser Murtaja was journalism. Mu'taz uh, Azaza, that's journalism. Palestinians right. are reaching out from the cage that Israel has put them in, and they are trying to speak to the world. Yeah, and they are I'm being met, saying, they are being met with cold indifference. And I would say to you, Piers, I would say to yeah. you that that gentleman that you've just had on the show Mark, mm -hmm. Mark Regev, he belongs in The Hague. David mm -hmm. Petraeus, you know, Piers, you made your reputation as opposing the invasion of Iraq. Well, yeah. I would ask you, journalist to journalist, how mm. could you justify the interview you just gave to the head of US forces in that illegal occupation of Iraq that David Petraeus led? He was then the head of the CIA. Both of the individuals mm. that you have just had on this show deserve to be in The Hague, tried for war crimes. I am not anything like them. I have not hurt a fly. Those two men have. Why are they given the respectability that you gave them with your interview? And why am I interrogated as if I am somehow someone that could hurt a human being? Well, certainly in Mark Regev's case, I pushed him hard on all the positions that Israel is currently hard. adopting. That wasn't well, okay. hard. 
Now, obviously very powerful from Loki there. Now, I, I went back to look at the Mark Gregev interview, obviously Piers Morgan saying, you know, that was a tough interview. Loki saying it wasn't. It wasn't a tough interview, right? Piers Morgan, he did. You can go watch it, you know, on Piers Morgan's channel or whatever. Piers Morgan was sort of saying, aren't you worried about killing all these civilians? And then Mark Gregev says, well, to, to, to kill Hamas, we have to kill some civilians. And it sort of just went around in circles like that. What Piers Morgan didn't do, which is what he did to, to Loki, is to say, do you condemn this thing? Do you condemn this thing? And there were a hell of a lot of questions you could ask of Mark Regev that would be very difficult for him to answer, right? So when it comes to, are you worried about killing civilians? They have this set piece answer. They say, well, this is because of Hamas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then Piers Morgan says, well, aren't you, you know, this many people are dying. He says, well, that's what we need to do to kill Hamas. Round and round in circles. That's essentially what happened. Why don't you say to Mark Regev, do you condemn the illegal expansion of settlements in the West Bank over and over again for the past four decades. There's no way you can say, oh, well, this is because of Hamas, this is because of... No, that, that is just a state wantonly breaking international law because it's in their self-interest, right? Why are they never asked to condemn that? Why are they never asked to condemn the siege of Gaza, right? Why are they never asked why they killed a bunch of people in the part of Palestine that Hamas don't even control, right? There are so many questions you can ask an Israeli politician where it is very black and white, do you condemn this, do you condemn that? But they don't. Right. The reason Piers Morgan gave Mark Regev an easy interview is because he pretended, or he let Mark Regev pretend, that this conflict started on the 7th of October. Right. I think it's really, really important that Israeli politicians aren't allowed to pretend that. I mean, that's been the controversy over Antonio Guterres, right? Because he was honest enough to say, well, this didn't start on October the 7th. Yes, targeting civilians is a war crime. Yes, targeting civilians is, is, is wrong. But this didn't happen in a vacuum, right? It's, it's, it's just ordinary common sense. But it is so rarely put to Israeli politicians. And yet you get someone like Loki on and they're constantly demanding, do you condemn this? Do you condemn this? As if they're a politician and then the politicians get off lightly. What I found actually really disturbing um, to watch over the past two weeks, amongst many disturbing things, of course, is just like the complete indifference that you that you know this is one of the few times that the question of the conditions that palestinians live under is actually being discussed like it's it's generally blends into the background of geopolitical the geopolitical reality that oh yeah the palestinians don't have any basic freedoms it's just kind of like saying the sky is blue now that we are actually having a situation where palestinians are you know sitting in front of, and I see this particularly with Hossam Zomlot, who was also interviewed by Piers Morgan, explaining, you know, what conditions his family and his friends and his community live in during peacetime, so-called peacetimes, um, and saying, you know, we are talking about a group, a population of people who are hemmed in, in a, ge in a geography that is basically the size of greater glasgow they can't leave unless they're giving a perm given a permit which they are basically never given every few years they they have their not only their physical infrastructure raised to the ground not just hospitals and and schools and all of the things that you need in order to make a society function but you also cut down the human infrastructure the social infrastructure that keeps a society going doctors nurses school teachers cleaners caretakers all kinds of people get you know are killed in a way that you can't recover for many generations to come that's why you know the gazan population is 50% under the age of 15 that has serious social consequences on a community and you're trying to explain this to people and you know to british journalists and it's just met with like this glazed over expression as if like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to say all of this so we can get to the actual, you know, so I can just get to my next question. And what I find so ridiculous about it is that these are the same British journalists who believed or entertained the idea that Britain didn't have sovereignty because it was in the EU or that it like, and not only was in the EU, but was like a major power in the EU. And the idea that that was some kind of grave violation of sovereignty was entertained and, and given credence and understood and given sympathy. Whereas living in an open air prison and saying that this is a violation of a fundamental human right of sovereignty and talking about the absolute, the psychological and physical terror that living under that kind of occupation looks like is met with, and you know, Loki used the phrase, and I have to repeat it, 
just cool indifference. And it's moments like that when, you know, as much as it's important for us to not lose hope, um, it's very difficult not to, you know, we don't, we, we don't, it's not our right to lose hope. It's our right to, 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 to seek, you know, a, a free and just future for a population that have been under immense discrimination and occupation for so many years. But it's very difficult to feel like, how do I persuade you that we are human beings like you are when clear, when, when nothing seems to be working. And I think that that sense of cool indifference to the lives and liberty of Palestinian people is, is incredibly, um, incredibly difficult. I found it incredibly difficult to stomach amongst so many things that have been difficult to stomach, um, over, over the past couple of years. And that's just what I'm reminded of when I see that interaction between, between Loki and, and Piers Morgan is it's just like, when you're trying to talk about the context, it's seen as like an annoying obstacle that we need to get over in order to talk about what we really want to talk about, which is how barbaric all Arabs are essentially and how deserving they are of, of whatever happens to them. I do think Piers Morgan actually has, has had a lot of really interesting pro-Palestinian voices on. And I do also see why a, a journalist might say, well, I want to ask the tough questions. I don't want the, 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 the guests to always talk about what they want to talk about. I want to ask them what they might find it difficult to talk about. Now, I would accept that if Piers Morgan gave Mark Gregor an equally tough interview that he gave to Loki. Now, obviously, I think you should give tougher interviews to, to former ambassadors and advisors, advisors to governments than you do to, to artists, right? But if he had given Mark Regev as tough an interview as he gave to Loki, I think that'd be fine. You could say, look, I'm, I'm not here just to let people talk about what they want to talk about. I'm here to ask the tough questions. But he asked tougher questions to Loki than he did to Mark Regev. And I do think that is completely unforgivable, essentially. Dahlia, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Thanks for having me. I wish it was under better circumstances. <laughs> and thank you all for tuning in. The show is back tomorrow from 6pm. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night. 